It is a special honor for me to introduce Bernie. He has been a stalwart supporter of the center since the day we opened and has come to Alabama to assist us more times than I can remember. We have had no more generous and committed supporter throughout all our years of operation. Bernie's career in fair housing spans 50 years. His civil rights advocacy began in 1965 when he was a young Catholic priest in Chicago who came to Selma at the time of the Selma to Montgomery March. Apart from his years of fair housing advocacy, he has uniquely used his photography to illustrate the history of the fair housing movement in this country and to directly show how housing discrimination harms families and communities. His photographs have been displayed or features in numerous locations throughout the country, including the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, the Rosa Parks Museum here in Montgomery, and the Smithsonian Institution, among numerous other venues. Bernie has dedicated his life to fair housing, and it is an honor for me to introduce him to you. Thank you, Bernie. It's for Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be with you this afternoon. It is uh, an honor. Uh, I uh, want to thank personally Kim for inviting me and for Faith. And uh, I am a longtime uh, admirer, as Faith pointed out of uh, your housing center. Uh, and I uh, want to thank you for the hard work that you put in to achieve justice in housing in, one, in an area of uncommon uh, difficulty. Uh, today, <clears throat> I am assisted by Ron uh, Hans, my computer angel, who <laughs> without him, this would not be possible and I'm forever grateful. Uh, I'm also assisted by uh, Sue, my angel in design, she uh, couldn't be here today, but uh, uh, she worked so hard to make all of this happen. And I uh, greatly appreciate um, uh, the work that she puts in. Uh, so <clears throat> the title of my talk today is uh, In Darkness, there is light. But before we get to that, I, I want to mention the sacred words on the wall of the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery. For the hanged and beaten, for the shot drowned and burned, for the tortured, tormented and terrorized, for those abandoned by the rule of law, we will remember with hope because hopelessness is the enemy of justice, with persistence because justice is a constant struggle, with faith because we shall overcome. In darkness, there is light. In January, 1965, Dr. King wrote to the New York Times, this is Selma, Alabama. There are more Negroes in jail with me than there are on the voting rolls. So on March 7, 1965, 600 marchers left the Brown Chapel in Selma in their attempt to march to Montgomery. They were led by John Lewis, and Hosea Williams. The march was about the right to vote. The marchers crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge, named after a Confederate general and Grand Dragon of the Alabama KKK. The marchers immediately faced a wall of state troopers wearing helmets and holding billy clubs without warning. The troopers wearing gas masks charged the defenseless and unarmed marchers beat them with clubs and tear gas them. Uh, and uh, they beat them, they beat the marchers down to the ground who were forced to retreat back over the bridge. It was a picture of hate, cowardice and fear.
deputies of, of J Sheriff Jim Clark, some on horseback, trampled the marchers who were gra gasping for breath while running for freedom back to the Brown Chapel. I am sure more than one of them said, I can't breathe. Years later, I spoke with Mama Lily, one of the marchers. She said, after crossing the bridge on Bloody Sunday, I saw all the horses, but I just kept marching. Suddenly, I was tear gassed, and one of the horses knocked me down and trampled me on my back. When I got up, I just started running back to the Brown Chapel. I knew I was somebody but they didn't treat me like I was somebody. Treated me just like dirt, like I was a dog. Wasn't as good as a dog. That bothered me for a long, long time. When we meet someone badly hurt, like Mama Lily, we do not ask how they're feeling. Rather, we ourselves should become part of that hurt or injured person, and only then will we understand. My involvement in civil rights began on Bloody Sunday while viewing the marchers on TV, fighting for voting rights. That's when I realized I had to do something. From that moment on, there was no turning back. Eight days later, my friend Bill Walls and I flew to Selma the week after Reverend James Reeb was beaten and killed by thugs in that city. As a priest and a teacher, I felt I had to go for myself, for the people of Selma, for as an example to my congregation and my students at Immaculate Conception High School. Each day in Selma, we walked in solemn dignity from the Brown Chapel to City Hall, demanding that everyone have the right to vote. We walked two by two, dressed like we were going in ch to church. In fact, the marchers always began and ended at the Brown Chapel. The peaceful, nonviolent protests impacted not only Selma, but the entire country. Remember this and more. I wonder why anyone would try to suppress or take away a person's right to vote, which was won over the blood-soaked bodies and tear-filled uh, eyes of men, women, and children who fought for that right. Now, 56 years later, we still must continue to fight for voting rights. Two days before the successful march to Montgomery, I was taken into custody for merely walking in a Selma neighborhood with four other peaceful protesters. Our group uh, of five, together with other similar groups, were brought to a central location where we were jailed. I wish I could have photographed Sheriff Jim Clark, the state troopers, in their full riot gear and self-appointed community anointed posse given only a badge and a club. They surrounded me and 150 or so other peaceful freedom fighters. The irony of the police in riot gear was lost on the troopers, but not on the world. Even with all their riot gear, guns, tear gas, clubs, and badges. They were more fearful of us than we were of them, and we were unarmed. This action in Selma is a reminder that when we bravely stand up against injustice in civil or human rights, it is as if we're riding on the same bus with Rosa Parks, walking over the same bridge with John Lewis, marching in the same streets of Chicago with Dr. King, or protesting uh, with Black Lives Matter in cities throughout the country. Ultimately, 
Selma was about voting rights in, in 1965. Uh, crossing the bridge was more than a symbolic gesture. It was a crossing that ultimately changed the law and maybe a few hearts uh, uh, along the way. And yet I still wonder why millions of eligible voters fail to exercise their right to vote in federal, state, or local elections. When America thinks of the civil rights movement, most think of bus boycotts, voting rights, freedom rides, integrating lunch counters, movie theaters, water fountains, and so much more. Few are aware that Dr. King not only marched in Chicago, but lived here as well. He, his work in Chicago is the best kept secret of the civil rights movement. Dr. King certainly came to the city to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. But more specifically and more importantly, uh, Dr. King came to Chicago to focus the attention of the nation on open housing, now fair housing, and ended racial and economic segregation in America's most segregated city. More, more and more, America is making the connection between Dr. King's work and fair housing. On July 10, 1966, it was my honor to photograph Dr. King in Soldier Field as he spoke the following words from the podium. We assemble here today to march to City Hall to demand redress of our legitimate grievances. I am, I am still convinced that there is nothing more powerful to dramatize and expose this social evil than the tramp, tram, tramp of marching feet. Dr. King explains who is marching. He said, these are they whose children have been so scarred by the system of oppression that they often have clouds of infer inferiority floating in their heads. <clears throat> these are they who with tear drenched eyes have had to stand over the coffins of four little beautiful, innocent, unoffending Negro girls in Birmingham and Emmett Till and Medgar Evers in Mississippi. These are they who are constantly fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness and who find themselves daily standing at tiptoe stance, not knowing which insult to expect next. These are they who have come from the sun-drenched poverty of Puerto Rico and Mexico in search of, of the gold of human kindness in this land of opportunity, only to find themselves relegated to a cold and lonely journey through these concrete jungles. Still, Dr. King emphasized that our power is not in violence. Our power is in the unity, the force of our souls, and the determination of our bodies. Nonviolence does not mean doing nothing. It, it means standing up so strongly with your body and soul that you cannot stoop to the low places of violence and hatred. Dr. King said on July 18, 1967, there is nothing more dangerous than to build a society that, that they have, that feel they have no stake in it, who feel that they have nothing to lose. What I'm getting at is this, a riot is the language of the unheard. And we must honestly admit that there are several things that America has refused to hear. Doctor, during July, 1966, Dr. King and his staff 
conducted fair housing tests in Chicago, especially in Chicago's segregated white neighborhoods. And there he said, we sent Negroes in large numbers to real estate offices in the Gage Park neighborhood. Every time Negroes went in, the real estate agent said, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have anything listed. And then soon after that, we sent in some of our fine white staff members into those same real estate offices. And the minute the white person got in, they, they opened the books and said, oh yes, we have several things. Now, what is it exactly that you want? In the open, the open housing march that I was in on July 31st, 1966, was especially vicious and brutal. The Chicago Tribune tells it this way. Civil rights hecklers burned cars, two were pushed into the lagoon. Windows and windshields were smashed on at least 30 cars and dozens of tires were slashed. Also, cherry bombs and firecrackers were tossed among the marchers as police and bricks flew through the air. All of this occurred under the watchful eye or painful, uh, excuse me, or blind eye of the Chicago police. On March 5, 1966, Dr. King said, when we were demonstrating around the whole issue of open housing, we were confronted with massive violence as we marched into certain areas. We suffered in the process of trying to tell, trying to dramatize the issue through our marches into all white areas that denied us access to houses and where real estate agents would not allow us to see the listings. Swastikas bloomed in Chicago parks like misbegotten weeds. Our marches were met by a hailstorm of bricks, bottles, and firecrackers. I've been in many demonstrations across the South, but I can say that I've never seen, even in demonstrations across the South, but I, I can never seen, even in Mississippi, mobs as hostile and as hate-filled as in Chicago. It was here that do, the, it was during this march that Dr. King was struck in the head by a rock. Today, we're most grateful for the courageous, compassionate, and committed lawyers who remain constant in the fight for equality, freedom, and humanity. Dr. King said of lawyers, I have a deep abiding admiration for the legal profession and the tremendous role it has played in the service of the cause with which I have been identified. The road to freedom is now a highway because lawyers throughout the land yesterday and today have helped clear the obstructions, uh, have helped eliminate roadblocks by their selfless and courageous espousal of difficult and unpopular cases. By the way, Dr. King had more than 60 lawyers helping him throughout his career. Dr. King's words on the Montgomery bus boycott would, should inspire uh, protesters and also lawyers today. We can never forget those beautiful days in Montgomery, Alabama when 50,000 black men, women and women, boys and girls decided that it was ultimately more honorable to walk the streets in dignity than ride the buses in humiliation. For 381 days, 
they substituted tired feet for uh, tired souls and walked the streets of that city until the sagging walls of bus segregation were finally crushed by the battered rams of the forces of justice. Rosa Parks teaches us that patience, courage, and perseverance are key ingredients in our protests for justice. So let us now celebrate the life of Rosa Parks. She is not only a great woman in her own right, but Rosa Parks made Dr. King into a civil rights leader as a minister of Dr. Uh, as a minister, excuse me, as a minister, Dr. King's agenda was his trilogy of evils, racial injustice, militarism, poverty, not civil rights. The way I look at his career, says Professor Claiborne Carson, is that he went on a detour uh, because of Rosa Parks. He was drafted into the civil rights movement for more than 10 years. I think all of us would agree he did a pretty good job. You know, politicians <clears throat> often take credit for the low unemployment rate among people of color. Dr. King said, that's based on statistics gathered on the basis of people who go to seek jobs, people who have once been in the labor market, who it doesn't deal with what we refer to as the discouraged, people who have just lost hope, people who have lost motivation to even look for jobs, who have come to feel that life is a long and desolate corridor with no exit signs. And they have been defeated so many times, so many doors have been closed in their faces that they've given up. In 1863, the Negro was freed from the bondage of physical slavery through the Emancipation Proclamation. But emancipation for the Negro was freedom to hunger. It was freedom to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without roofs to cover their heads. It was freedom without land to cultivate, without bread to eat. It was freedom and famine at the same time. Brian Stevenson, lawyer, activist, and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative claims, slavery didn't end in 1863, it evolved. In an exclusive meeting between former Governor George Wallace, Fred Gray, Dr. King's first lawyer, and Northwestern University professor Darlene Hine, the following transpired. George Wallace, black people are my best friends. I love black people. All you historians have gotten me wrong. I never was a segregationist. Professor Hine, but you stood in front of the door of, of the school. You said segregation now, segregation forever. Why did you say those things? George Wallace. White people made me say that. I wanted to be elected governor. I had to say these things, but I didn't mean them. Unfortunately, there are too many George Wallaces today in our local governments, Congress, the Senate, and the governorships. <clears throat> we still live in a time and in a country seared by a system of danger, darkness, division, and deceit. Many of us, broken from the crippling diseases of discrimination, segregation, and despair, sadly, housing and racial injustice still happens in so many ugly 
and hurtful ways, and it doesn't happen in a vacuum. All of us see it, feel it, fight it, hear it, ignore it, protest it, profit from it, tolerate it, initiate it, provoke it, perpetuate it, suffer from it, or even die from it. On July 18, 1967, Dr. King said, the church has so often failed to take a stand and has so often been a taillight instead of a headlight. So many clergy preferred to remain silent in the midst of racial injustice, hiding behind the safe security of stained glass windows. Today, I ask you, where have all the churches gone? Avoiding justice, almost everyone. When will they ever learn? Professor Okimer Dark, who was a law professor, experienced housing discrimination, reminds us that discrimination is an act <clears throat> of violence against the dignity of an individual. And every time an individual is harmed by discrimination, so is the fabric of our society. Discrimination is not a little matter. It's not just something that happens and you get over it. It's not just something that happens and happens and you get used to it. Who should get used to being degraded? Who should ever have to get used to that? America still struggles to reckon with its past and for the legacy of Dr. King. In Alabama and Mississippi, the holiday for Dr. Martin Luther King and Robert E. Lee are indefensibly celebrated. One, a beloved civil rights leader, the other, a general who shameful, shamefully fought vigorously to maintain slavery. Many politicians are crying over the taking down of memorials celebrating traitors, slave owners, and executioners. Let them cry. How would you feel if every day when you drove or walked to work or school, you were exposed to monuments of, the, of men who lynched, raped, murdered, or enslaved your family. How would you feel? How would that make you feel? This, many of you know, or some might know, this is a photograph of Tarana Burke, the founder of the uh, Me Too movement. There are no monuments to Hitler in Germany. Yet the world will never forget him. German President Frank Walter Steinmeier referred to his country and said, this is a country you can only love with a broken heart. Many Americans must feel the same way about our country. We will never forget the traitors, slave owners and mur murderers of the past. We learn from our mistakes. We don't celebrate them. Hopefully, there will come a time when we are able to love our country and love justice. Brian Stevenson reminds us, in Germany, people are not trying to erect monuments and memorials to the architects of Nazism and fascism. I think there is a recognition that what happened during the era was not just wrong, but shamefully uh, destructive. We haven't made it consequential for people uh, in America to engage in this kind of romantic uh, and misguided worldview around our history. People haven't been motivated to see the harm. That's why articulating the harm the damage, the pain, the agony, the anguish, 
created by slavery, lynching, and segregation is so urgent and so important. He also states, lynching in America was a form of terrorism that has contributed to a legacy of racial inequality that our nation must address. It must address it more directly and concre concretely than we have to date. The trauma and anguish that lynching and racial violence created in this country continues to haunt us and to contaminate race relations and our criminal justice system in too many places. Today, we need a more honest assessment of America's strengths and weaknesses. We must remember that while our country was founded in, in, on the premise that all men are created equally, this ideal was violated at its inception. Some of you might worry that we are just one person and we can't bring about the changes you desire. Maybe this African saying might help. If you think you are too small to make a difference, try spending the night in a closed room with a mosquito. Today, I ask you to consider five actions in standing up for civil and human rights in our country. Number one, I'm in agreement with Gordon Parks who said, I saw that the camera could be a weapon against poverty, against racism, against all sorts of social wrongs. I knew that at that point, I had to have a camera. Now cameras and phones have become the world's eyes for truth and justice. Be watchful and ready if you see hatred and racial violence. Had the murder of George Floyd not been recorded from various critical vantage points, America would never have heard of George Floyd. Through the color photographs that I took of Dr. King in Chicago in 1965 in 1966, it has been my privilege to bring his message to life in a way almost never seen on TV or in print. The Birmingham Civil Rights Institute says these photographs of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Chicago in 1966 are some of the first color photographs that the world saw of Dr. King. Mr. Kleiner captured one of the most violent missions Dr. King undertook and it wasn't in the deep south. Number two, <clears throat> earlier I quoted Dr. King when he said, there is nothing more powerful to dramatize and expose this, a social evil than the tramp, tramp, tramp of marching feet. We no longer have Rosa Parks, Coretta, John Lewis, Malcolm X, Dorothy Height, and so many others. But today we have you and America is grateful for all those who do remember the words, lives and sacrifices of, of our uh, civil rights heroes and have the courage to stand against uh, racial and ethnic violence and stand up for civil and human rights in the country. Based on my experiences as a civil rights activist and photographer in marches in the South and in the North, with many civil rights heroes past and pre present, these are my suggestions for protesting. Civil rights marches <clears throat> must be peaceful, designed to educate, inspire, change laws, rid the country of illegal 
oppressive or harmful practices and remove from offices bigoted and hateful politicians. Civil rights marchers never destroy, tear down, vandalize, taunt, set fires, damage or injure people or property. Marchers often delay traffic, but that should never be the goal. Experienced and trusted protesters should be in the front lines of all marches. They know <clears throat> what should and should not be done when confronted by police or groups with opposing objectives. If you march, leave your bicycles, skateboards, umbrellas, and roller skates at home. In some marches, these items have been used by infiltrators as weapons. <clears throat> Remember, this is a march, not a picnic. Marches must never give unwitting cover to those who come to sow discord and create an atmosphere of violence and hate. Marchers with anger management pro problems and issues must stay home. Find creative ways to march peacefully and respectfully in small groups in neighborhoods on issues important to families living there. Choose your civil rights marches wisely. Marches should focus on issues that make revolution unnecessary. Before marching, watch news clips of men and women like Dr. King, Rosa Parks, John Lewis, C.T. Vivian, and others. They marched, stood, and knelt with dignity. Their actions spoke to the heart and soul of America and changed our country forever. We must do no less. Number three, the endemic nature of discrimination in some ways makes it easy to ignore. It is as if everyone in our society has the flu perpetually. Under such circumstances, it takes careful analysis to recognize that despite its prevalence, to have the flu is to be sick. Too often, people tend to mistake uh, the prevalence of a form of behavior as testimony to its normalcy. I ask that in your personal and corporate lives that you never adjust to the comfortable normalcy of discrimination and hate. Number four, the names of public spaces, monuments and memorials should reflect our most successful and proudest moments. It is unconscionable that the bridge John Lewis and hundreds of freedom marchers walked over on Bloody Sunday is still called the Edmund Pettus Bridge, named after a Confederate general and grand dragon of the Alabama KKK. Let us make our voices heard and change the name of, to the John Lewis Memorial Bridge. Number five, I'm taking a slight liberty in quoting what Quincy Jones said about pianist and singer John Baptiste. I think uh, what he said really can apply to uh, all of us. He said, <clears throat> Affirming myself every morning is a very important part of my daily routine because if I don't know who I am, someone else will decide for me. You've got to know who you are and where you come from in order to get where you want to go. Believing in yourself and fill it and and 
filling your mind and soul with purpose is essential to being able to create art and create life. Quincy went on to say, and there is no better time to create than now. I've seen the way he uses his art and life to help restore hope, joy, and maintain a sense of community in times of a vast division. Finally, many people have lost hope and it is hopelessness more than pain that crushes the human spirit. As a result, when the minds of your family and friends are full of fear and worry, there is no room for them to dream or hope. John Lewis reminds us that we cannot get lost in a sea of despair. Rather, we need to begin anew because hopelessness is the enemy of justice. It is the enemy of our dreams, our courage, and our faith. Please make, please make it your calling and your task to find equitable laws and solutions that protect because it is justice that redeems, compassion that heals, courage that inspires, and mercy that forgives. Thank you very much. The last picture, by the way, is a picture of our nephew, Nathan, who uh, we've spent so much time with him as he grew up and, uh, and uh, love him so much. And part of my uh, work in fair housing is to make sure his life is okay, good for him as he grows up. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. That was wonderful. Um, we had a few questions and if anybody else has any questions, please add them to the question and answer box or to the chat and we will try and ask them and moderate the questions for, um, for everyone. Um, so the first question that we had today was, how would you compare the fight for civil rights and fair housing today versus in the 60s? Well, unfortunately, uh, there isn't that much difference. Uh, I think the marchers in 65 and 66 were more disciplined than they are now. <clears throat> but at that time, we still had trouble with the police and still have pro problems with the police today. Uh, you would think, and I certainly thought in, in the 60s that things would be so, so much different today, but they're not. Uh, some of the same issues are still present. The same issues in fair housing uh, are still present. The, uh, uh, you know, I talked about Dr. King sending testers into neighborhoods in Chicago. And unfortunately, that's what your center is still doing. Uh, so I, I had hoped in the 60s that would be further along uh, in our fight for justice. And we are further along, but not where we should be. Okay. Yeah, that's true. I think we still have a long way to go. Um, we do. <laughs> definitely do. And how, I guess, so I know you were, you started off in the clergy and then you transitioned to a photographer and then turned into a fair housing advocate. Can you tell us a little bit about that, how you transitioned into those different roles and why? Well, actually, when I took the photographs of Dr. King that you saw in 1965 and 1966, uh, I was a Catholic priest at that time. And I was um, uh, a Catholic priest, but I was also pretty ignorant as how to take pictures. Uh, I mean, before that time, I just took uh, photographs of family uh, and vacations, nothing like what I did 
uh, in front of Dr. King. Um, but that's why I shot in color. It didn't even occur to me to shoot in black and white. Had I been a professional photographer at that time, I would have photographed him in, like everybody else, in black and white. But I like to say, not correctly, of course, but I still like to say it, that I was ahead of my time. So sometimes, uh, sometimes ignorance is bliss. And that certainly is one example of it. Okay. I, a little bit further though, that um, uh, listening to Dr. King talk about uh, fair housing, uh, uh, talk about uh, compassion, talking about uh, nonviolence, uh, it led me on my, in my direction of fighting for fair housing, which I did uh, for more than 40 uh, years in, uh, in the Chicago area. So the transition was pretty easy because, uh, well, because of Dr. King. Okay. Now, and you mentioned a, a little bit during your presentation about the role of photographers in the fight for fair housing and civil rights. Can you expand on that at all? Sure. <clears throat> Yeah, unlike way back when in my day, few people had cameras. Today, everyone's a photographer. <laughs> well, every, everyone except me, I still have a flip top phone, but we won't get into that embarrassing situation now. But, but really, so many people have the opportunity to photograph and we see that in, uh, in George Floyd, uh, where several people photographed what was going on. And that really is making all the difference, I think, in his trial. And there are so many other opportunities where people's uh, uh, phones have been able to capture uh, correctly uh, what was going on. And they really have become uh, the uh, the truth and, and justice of of this country. Uh, we don't rely on professional photographers to capture some of these issues because they may not be there. But good people have been there, and they've uh, they photographed with their uh, their their phones, and and they've done an excellent job. Okay. So I know um, you mentioned that you were not, well, a professional photographer at the time whenever you started taking photos of Martin Luther King or of the march. Um, how did, and I guess it was a happy accident that you had the color photos. Um, what kind of triggered your thought process or why did you pick up a camera and go take pictures? Well, it's, <laughs> I, I kind of ask myself that question still. Uh, but at the time, there was a lot of criticism against Dr. King and saying he was the cause of the violence connected with the demonstrations. So I felt that there should be someone to document what was going on. And there didn't seem to be any. So I took it upon myself, foolishly, uh, to do just that. And why I thought I could do that, I, I still don't know. But I, I do tell, especially young people, that don't wait until you think you're completely uh, uh, ready uh, to do what you want to do photographically or really in any profession. Just do it. Do the best you can and, uh, and hope for the best. And, and I've, I've been very fortunate because um, my photographs are in, in a number of museums. Currently, they're being exhibited at, at the Elmhurst Art Museum in Elmhurst, Illinois, but they're also in the uh, Smithsonian. So um, I, I, even though I'm very critical and I look at each one and say, oh, you know, why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? Um, and, and even more, why, why did I go to these events? these historic events 
with one roll of film. <laughs> I, you know, to this day, I, I'm embarrassed about that, but what can I do? That's the way it was. The only thing I will say in my defense is that I knew how many pictures I had. I was very careful uh, about each shot and, and made each shot count. Unlike I see a lot of photographers today, they might take a hundred and I, I think they're just hoping to have a good one. I took one and I knew I was gonna get the right shot. That's, uh, that's impressive. I don't even know anybody who could take one selfie and get a good shot. So it's a different, different day today. <laughs> Um, and then you just gave a good bit of advice about, you know, if you're passionate about something kind of stepping forward, even if you're not an expert in it. Um, but would you have any other advice for the next generation or the upcoming generation on the fight for civil rights? Well, again, <clears throat> Dr. King talked about nothing is more helpful in changing society than the tramp, tramp, tramp. Of, uh, of feet. And, and I, I believe strongly that demonstrations are so important, uh, but they have to be peaceful. They have to be conducted properly. And that's not an easy thing to do, especially when they're happening uh, in many cities throughout the country. There's not the control that there was uh, previously. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I urge people to participate in those demonstrations. I urge uh, uh, people uh, to uh, 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 get involved in politics uh, and more, especially more women are involved in politics than, than ever before. I encourage those people again with the, uh, the uh, iPhones to be uh, vigilant about what's happening around them, uh, because you never know how that those pictures might uh, uh, be used, as is in the case against an, of the trial of George Floyd. So there, there are so many opportunities for young people to uh, to stand up uh, for uh, for civil rights, and you know I think at, at times it it was. <clears throat> it was very difficult. Uh, it was very difficult for me to be uh, nonviolent. In, in one march, especially, uh, I was being uh, poked by this one guy, and I had, I, you know, I, I mean, I had played football in college. I was in excellent shape, unlike now, but I was in excellent shape. No one would poke me in the shoulder or spit at me and get away with it. And so there were only, I think, 300 of us marching. We're surrounded by a few thousand uh, against us. But still, I had the nerve to say, I wouldn't do that if I were you to this guy that was spitting at me. The older black man in front of me turned around and said, remember why you're here, brother. And from that point on, I shut up and just took whatever came my way. And it was a very violent march with uh, dodge, dodging uh, bricks and, and uh, bottles, cherry bombs, firecrackers. It, it was, and, and this is all, um, we we're all protected on both sides by police and they did nothing to protect us. Uh, the only time they would intervene is when someone accidentally hit them and then they would take action. But there, there are so many opportunities. Uh, I think we just have to look for them and do something about it. I, I don't know what my life would be like had I not been involved in civil rights. I feel so good about what I was able to do, even though I, I know I, I haven't done enough, but I, I still feel good about what I was able to accomplish and uh, young people are going to feel the same way. Okay. Yeah, I think I think participation is is key. You know, we have a lot of 
um, I call it like keyboard advocacy, where we'll stand behind the keyboard and speak out against it. And I think that's a part of it is having your voice heard. But um, whenever we have marches and making sure that you participate and you come out um, and it's those extra steps. So I agree. I think that's really great advice. So thank you. There's um, nothing like getting out on the street and making not only your voice heard, but your physical presence seen. Uh, mm -hmm. The only thing, again, <clears throat> I don't like to keep talking about this, but, you know, back in the day, we used to say the whole world is watching. We have to remember the whole world is still watching. They're watching both sides, the police and the demonstrators. And so we have to be, march with, uh, with, with pride, with nonviolence, and, uh, and we can accomplish so much doing that. Okay. Um, and then just to shift it kind of back to you and your photography, um, have you, I know you took the original photos of Martin Luther King in color or some of the first, um, and then we saw throughout the presentation that you took a lot of um, really great photos of memorials and such. How do you think your photography has evolved over time? And are you still um, actively a photographer, I guess, and trying to document still, the movement? I'm still photographing. I do not dare get into a demonstration now because of my knees. Uh, I would be run over. And uh, so I, I don't want that to happen. But um, I, I think I was very fortunate through the years in my uh, work for fair housing that I was able to uh, complement uh, my work in fair housing with images. I, I remember one time, <clears throat> one uh, city in my service area uh, decided to essentially uh, uh, destroy the homes in this one district uh, and of course, they're all occupied by uh, Latino families. And so I went and photographed each one. And uh, they were nicely, uh, they were nice homes, well kept, and uh, got them to the Justice Department. And in those days, unlike last year, we had, we had a good Justice Department. Uh, <clears throat> now we're back to that now. But the Justice Department decided to intervene in the case and stood up for the families and their homes were not destroyed. So that's, that's just one uh, example of where I could combine my photography uh, with my uh, fight for fair housing. You know, I don't, um, I've been in the fair housing realm for a, while, a little while now. And I don't know another fair housing or any fair housing center who doesn't have at least one of your photos to share and to show some of the work that you've done and to advocate for that. And we are so grateful that you um, allow the fair housing world to use your photos. So thank you for that. Well, <laughs> <clears throat> should have some of my photos of Dr. King. And I mean, I, I say that kind of jokingly, but what I'm getting at really is I think that there's a lot of people in fair housing that don't understand Dr. King's role in fair housing, that uh, they don't know that he came to Chicago specifically to focus on open housing is what we called it in, in those days and, and now fair housing. And I think people would feel better about what they do if they knew they were just following in the footsteps of Dr. King, it, it makes me, it's made me feel better. And I think it would make other people feel better as well. So everyone should go out and get my pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Everyone should have one of your photos at least. <laughs> okay. And um, I know we talked about the evolution of your photography. Do you, uh, and I'm assuming you, despite your cell phone still being a flip phone, you've evolved your um, camera, but do you still have the original camera? Well, thank you for asking, I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, 
Um, well, let me hold this up. Uh, I, I don't know if you can. can we you can see, see yeah. Uh, it was. A very simple camera and my cameras today are not at all like the one I just showed you. And of course I have uh, 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 much many more lenses and you know I can do everything. Um, but that wasn't the case then. What uh, I guess what I'd like to mention is that one reason why I was able to get so close to Dr. King is that there were no there was no security. I I was at times as as my uh, photo show I was within you know six feet of of Dr. King and and Coretta. There was no one to say you know back off or get away. You, you, let's see your credentials. Uh, I was able to get uh, just below Dr. King when he was on a podium. Uh, so. Uh, I was able to do what I was able to do because there was no opposition. There was no one saying uh, you can't uh, you can't get in. But I think you can do so much with any kind of camera, and I urge people to to do just that. I don't think we have any more questions. Um, I'm so thankful for your time today and for all of the work that you have done um, with us and then for everybody in general and for Fair Housing. So I just want to thank you for taking time to present and to participate today. Well, Kim, thank you so much. It's, uh, it, it really is an honor for me to have been able to work with your center. Um, I, uh, I, I can't thank you enough for the work that you continue to do in one of the most difficult areas in our country. I hope HUD understands that and appreciates that, but I don't know, yeah. but thank you. I think they try to understand. I hope they try to understand and you know, we're just continuing in, in the great footsteps. So we can't take too much credit here, but we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of the attendees who came today and participated. We are so grateful that you spent some of your afternoon with us. Um, as the Fair Housing Month in April continue, we will have some additional events coming up towards the end of the month. I think our dates are the 27th and the 28th. If you're on our social media um, or if you're not, please follow us. We've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and we will post more information about these events that are coming up. And I would just like to, again, thank you all for attending and participating. You should get a short survey after you log out. So thank you. Thanks. Bye.